Well, good morning, church family. It's so good to be here with you today. If you haven't noticed, it looks slightly different than uh, when uh, somebody is giving a message, and uh, that's intentional for today. We wanted to be able to dive into Scripture and be able to um, ask the hard questions that we normally ask on a Sunday, but to try it in a different format. And maybe you saw in our uh, all-church email, uh, we're going to do Q&A with PB and J. Oh, see, oh, 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 yeah. I'll be here all day. <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, I, I think that um, our, our honest hope is that today would be an honest dialogue and even that we would press into some of the more challenging questions that Genesis 6, the story of Noah, presents to us as um, the flood comes and happens. And so, uh, we're, we have some questions pre-prepared. Some people have sent in some questions already on social media that we have jotted down. And we wanted to let you know that you can actually send in questions live throughout the service. And uh, whether you're watching online, if you're watching live, obviously if you're watching uh, later on YouTube, you can't do that. But uh, if, if you want to be able to participate in that way, you can go to a website. It's sli.do. That's the whole thing. And then what you're going to do is type in the word Genesis in all capitals, but change the E's to three. So G, three, N, I want to make sure I get this right, three, S-I-S, -S, easy for me to do. Uh, and once you do that, it, uh, you can click on a little uh, thing that says uh, Genesis with the threes there, and you'll be able to type in any questions. If there is a question that somebody else has already asked that's very similar to the one that you wanted to ask, you can simply like it, and it'll move it to the top here for me. And uh, so if I'm, I'm looking at my screens here, that's, uh, I'm checking out your questions, and uh, we'll do our best to uh, accommodate those and to do that. So um, with that said, I want to be able to jump into the passage in Genesis 6. I'll read some of the first portion, and then, Pastor, if you uh, want to read after that. This is Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Shepath. Great names. <laughs> now the Lord was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make for yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that is the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your son's wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, two of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eat, eaten and store it away as for food for you and for them. Noah did everything as God commanded him. Thank you. 
So uh, again, you can go ahead and be submitting any questions after you've uh, listened to the text there, um, anything that you would like for us to engage with. I think the, the first and the biggest question that I see in this text is that it seems like God is very frustrated and very angry. He's regretting that he has made humanity, and now he comes in with this judgment. And then I look at the message of Jesus and how he's this God, you know, of reconciliation and forgiveness and love. How, how do you navigate the, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament and the seemingly differences that there are there? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for starting with an easy yeah, question right. first. No softballs uh, out here. <laughs> you know, he, he could have asked how long did it rain. That would have been easy to, to do. So there's a, there's a mistake that often people insert into the reading of the text. They assume that God is angry. And it never says he's angry. It says he's grieved. And what grieves him is not just the disappointment of people not living up to his standards, it's what they're doing to each other. And so God has to do something, but his motive isn't anger. When we see what happens here is we do see judgment, and then we ask ourselves, well, what about Jesus? You know, why is he so different? Jesus is taking the judgment of God for us. So to think that there is no judgment in Old and New Testament, it's actually a very different thing. But the idea here is, is that the judgment that is coming is not born out of anger. God isn't having a bad day. That things had gotten to the place where he had to intervene. That's good. So uh, another question that's come in is, when, when God says that he regrets making them humanity, does this mean that God made a mistake? Good question. <laughs> Why are we doing this? Um. <laughs> Just to watch you sweat, really. It's, it's enjoyable for the rest of us. God's not the one who made the mistake. We did. Right. Like, people are living way outside of the boundaries of what God intended. And there's a kind of not just pain that comes to his heart but a desire to do something different. In fact, the, the word is, uh, in a lot of translations, is, is not just uh, regret, but repent. And the idea of repentance is now I'm going to do something else as a result of what's happened. And so God is going to do something else. He is going to address this. But it's not God saying he's made a mistake. It's God recognizing we have made, or humans have made, an unbelievable number of mistakes, and now something else needs to be done. Uh, another question that's come in, did dinosaurs not get the memo? <laughs> they did not. <laughs> they, 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 they're illiterate, they couldn't read, and they... <laughs> now, for Noah, what makes him be the exception to the rule in this situation? And we didn't read this this far in the passage, but later on, uh, we, we see this picture where uh, the, the flood happens and then uh, they, they make it to the other side. And then Noah uh, doesn't just uh, celebrate in what I would call an appropriate way. Instead, he's outside of the boat, naked, drunk. And uh, I mean, I don't know if that's something you come across regularly at Canadagua or not. Maybe that's the first question there. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So we got no, that answer. I, I do so, not so come tell across me that regularly, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, so you guys know what you were like after uh, a year of COVID. And you, you weren't cramped into small quarters with lots of animals and your family. So the Bible doesn't tell us that Noah was a perfect person, although there is a translation that says perfect in all his generations. A lot more translations use the, the word blameless. That, as it turns out, is a really big deal in Scripture, that God understands that there are times when we weren't intending to do wrong. We weren't acting either out of fear or frustration, but, um, but there was something that occurred that we didn't see coming or we didn't know how to handle it, and we mishandled it. And, and those people take responsibility for their actions. 
They don't just blame other people. They don't just throw someone under the bus. They say, you know what, that's on me. And they try to do the best they can to, to fix it. So in one sense, you have a guy who's, who's operating with a sense of responsibility about life. He takes it seriously. But the second thing that it really says about Noah that sets him apart is he walked with God. Th that is an amazing statement. It's not just saying that he believed in God or he had positive thoughts about God. There was a way he journeyed life day by day that was with God. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a guy who takes responsibility for his life and you have a person who wants to daily engage in a journey, this is why he's able to hear what God says to him. And this is why he's able to respond in a responsible way. That's what makes the difference. That's why Noah gets selected. Yeah. Now, now, how do we, in the 21st century, how do we walk with God regularly and well in our lives here in America? Yeah, well, I, I think that in some ways it's more mystical than we want it to be and more practical than we want it to be. Um, I, I know people who go about their devotional life, and by devotional life I'm referring to uh, people who spend time reading scripture and who spend time in prayer. And we often treat that as a task to be completed. I will read this much scripture and then I will pray about these number of things. And that doesn't feel very conversational. And um, I, I live with my wife. We, we do lots of things together. Uh, uh, yesterday we put up a tent in the backyard just to see if we could actually pull that off together. It was a test before we get out in the woods in the middle of the night. And, figure it out there that we're not cut out for this kind of thing. But the idea there is that it requires some kind of communication. When you think about scripture, if you think about it, this is God trying to speak to me. When you think about prayer, this is my talking to him and listening. That it becomes a journey that you're doing together rather than just a service you attend or a religious task you complete. Right. And I think that is the, the idea of walking with God. All right, another question that's come in. Instead of wiping humans from the face of the earth from their downfalls, why did God not attempt to eliminate Satan instead? Why did he choose <laughs> that option? These are all really such good questions. <laughs> I'll be preaching again next Sunday. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, it's a good question. So the first thing I would say is the idea about wiping people from the face of the earth. That's an astonishing statement. And there's, there's no one that we can think of in history who has tried such a thing that we hold in any esteem or regard. These are the villains of history and we know their names even if we didn't major in history. These are not good people. So why does God get to, to get away with this? And it's because we don't understand what's happening prior to this. There, there's some really powerful clues in the passage. And it says, it says, everyone's thoughts were evil all of the time. That's not just a, an occasional temptation. The culture had completely become about how you could take or impose or violate something or someone else. And then it also says that the world was corrupt and filled with violence. Before there was ever a violence of, or, or before there was a flood of water, there was a flood of violence over the earth. And I'm not just talking about a few skirmishes. This isn't like watching a hockey game. That's not what's going on here. This is, this is violence all the time everywhere and like right now I can I can go online or I can watch the news and see some of the violence that is occurring in one of the major war-torn areas of the world and we see what's happening and we're offended by it but here's the point is that when we see it we're offended and there are people who believe it's wrong and there are people who are trying to help Back in the time of Noah, no one else thought it was wrong and no one was trying to help. If anything, they were only inspired. If that person hurt that person that way, then I can do that to this person. There was a flood of violence. And so God says, and this is a really cool concept, right? The word for corrupt 
is, is a, it's a play on words. And it says corruption means it's, it's destroying the, the, the planet. It's destroying humanity. And this is what God is saying. I will destroy the destruction. That's, that's what God is doing in the flood. Hmm. Wow. So, you know, a, a, another question that comes in that's really similar to this is, you know, basically God is allowed to violate one of his commandments, thou shall not kill. Uh, how, how do you reconcile that uh, with his commandment to us and with how he responds to this situation? Um, well, I, I think a couple of things about that. First of all is that um, human beings very rarely take life for good reasons. I won't say never. And I do understand that there are people who would say there is no reason to take another life. There might be a reason to die for something you believe in, but not take life. But we have to understand that God is the author of life and that he's not just claiming right to, to end life because I made you and I'll take you out. What he's saying is, is that a line has been crossed where no one is safe anymore. And it's worst for the weak, for the children, for those who are vulnerable. And, and everyone is either infected with or impacted by. And so now it becomes more like trying to take cancer out of your body than it is about trying to destroy a body. And by the way, God could have ended all human history. We didn't have to get past chapter six in human history. That could be the end of it. But God did decide that he was going to work redemptively. So he keeps Noah, his wife, his three sons, their wives, and animals, because while he's going to wipe evil off the face of the earth, it's not his intention to eliminate humanity. Hmm. Another good question has come in as well. God likely is grieving these times we're in. How do you think he will deal with corruption in our world today? Yeah. Um, so there's a part of me that wishes um, for kind of uh, very selective disasters, you know, to come on the people most deserving. It's not how our world works. And so this is a really strange concept. In our world, we see a lot of things that go wrong and, and a lot of people will claim that to be the judgment of God. An earthquake happens and that was the judgment of God. Uh, a flood happens, that was the judgment of God. And there's this really interesting picture that God uses uh, to bring some sense of um, comfort to Noah, because it's, it's going to rain again, right? <laughs> and when it rains, he's going to have some PTSD. And, and he says, I'll, I'll put a bow in the sky. And I always thought that that bow was just like, like a ribbon, you know? Oh, look at that. Isn't that pretty? A multicolored ribbon in the sky. But th that's not what the word is. The word is a bow like an archer. And what is God saying? He's saying, look at, look at the bow. Which way is it bent? Where's the arrow flying? In the future, I will take the judgment rather than imposing it on you. So what we see right now is very clearly a broken world where bad things happen and broken people who either do intentionally or unintentionally things that causes pain to others. But what we don't see is the judgment of God in our world. Now, I will say that we do see the discipline of God, which is not the same thing. And the Bible does say that God disciplines those that he loves. If you're a parent, you understand this concept. It's not about just causing pain and punishment for stepping out of bounds. How can we learn a lesson so that you grow from that experience and respond differently in the future? But the idea is, is when you see the bow in the sky, where's the arrow pointed? And it's not pointed at us right now. now. I feel like one of the concerns that could come from reading a text like this is 
uh, God uh, puts his punishment on humanity and every one of us in this room has done something wrong and we all look at it as a varying scale like I'm not as bad as him but I'm better than her or whatever you know like we do the comparison thing mm. but should we be concerned about the wrath of God for our own hearts and our own lives H how would you process that if we're concerned and living like that yeah, you can just like sleep with a life preserver under your bed. Uh, no. Uh, I do think, so this, fundamentally, this is how people think about sin, is that forgiveness is just a decision that you make that you're not, it doesn't count anymore. And um, anybody who thinks that forgiveness is like that has not lost a great deal or suffered a great deal or has not loved someone that it happened to. Because as soon as you love someone deeply, you know, you can't just say that that doesn't matter. Oh, it's just the past. And so this idea about judgment and how we think about our own sin, it's not just something that God says, yeah, it doesn't matter. I won't count it against you. A price has to be paid. The difference for us is Jesus has paid that price. And so that's how we, we have to think about that. And I, did, was that answering the question? Because I feel like I might have drifted, no, no pun intended, yeah, away that, from that. Yeah. No, I think that does. I think even too, like, maybe I'll, I'll even ask a follow-up with it. Sure. It's like, there can be sin that we have in our own hearts, in our own lives. And I guess it can just continue to grow in our lives. So how do we manage that for ourselves or even the people around us that are living in sin, whether followers of Jesus or not? Like, what do we do when we see that sin in our own hearts or in other people's hearts around us? Yeah, well, like we just talked about at communion, right? Start with a position of humility. I'm not going to justify this. I'm not going to blame someone else for this. I'm gonna own this. The sin is mine. The grace is his. Right. And so now we, we look to God, and what we say is, the price was paid, it was a real price, and it was really paid. The question is, am I going to trust in that price? And I think that that's where the transaction occurs, where we experience the grace of God for ourselves. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and invite the worship team back out. Mm. What, what do you think is the most important thing for us to take away from this story, from this text, for our lives, for today and for tomorrow? Yeah, that, that's a really good question too. Just to give you a sense, the story of Noah starts in chapter six, and chapters six, seven, eight, and nine are all about Noah and the flood. When you get into the ninth chapter, I mean, that much time has been devoted to it. There's a reason why this story gets this much play in scripture, these many words. And it's not just because it was a huge event, though it is. And it's not just a way for God to keep us a little bit on our toes and afraid. I might get you again if you keep stepping out of bounds. God said, I'll never again end all life on the earth with a flood, but he didn't say there would never be a flood and every one of us are gonna face them in our lives. The diagnosis that we never wanted and if it feels like a flood. The relationship shatters that you hoped would last forever and it feels like a flood. You say your final goodbye to someone that you can't imagine what the future will be like without them and you're facing a flood. The reason this passage is here is, how do we orient ourselves in a flood? And the answer is, trust God. That when we listen to what he says, the same flood that brought so much destruction to others is the same flood that lifted Noah up. And the only difference between the people who were destroyed by it and the person who was saved by it was belief in what God says. The takeaway from this passage is, believe what God says, act accordingly, and you won't have to fear any flood that comes into your life. Amen. Church, I'm gonna invite you to stand at this point, and Pastor, I would love 
for you to pray a prayer of faith for us this morning to help us to be able to lean into that, to live lives that are pursuing faith, that are pursuing Jesus. Um, so church, I would just invite you to even open your hands to be able to receive if you're comfortable and pastor, if you would lead us. Yeah, Father, the first thing we want to do is to come into your presence humbly and, and acknowledge a terrible thing about ourselves. And that is that sometimes when we see painful and horrible things happen to others, we sometimes wonder if it's your judgment. And I ask that you would help us understand that we live in a broken world that's capable of doing unbelievable things to people. So we just repent of that before you right now. The second thing is, is that we have our own faults and failures that we tend to, to unplay or downplay. And, and we, we often fear taking responsibility for them. I ask that you would help us not hide them or hide from them, but bring them fully to you and to trust your word to us. And your word tells us that every single person who accepts the price paid by Christ for them is rescued, is redeemed, is part of your family. And that's not just a temporary thing, it's a forever thing. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, Jesus is close. Let's sing and let's worship him.